Run, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch a jellyfish that runs like a man. Especially not when the jellyfish is actually a mushroom. Hello, hello, I'm Loxton, and we're about to spend far too long talking about four very similar Pokemon. Tentacool, Toad's Cool, Tentacruel, and Toad's Cruel. What a weird duo of duos. Well, uh, what can we learn from them? What are they based on? Why are these two different Pokemon instead of being simple regional variants? Well, that last question is easy. Regional variants are all based on minor variations within a similar species, like both executors are still palm trees, both toros are still bulls, all three meows are house cats. You know, you got a fox and an arctic fox, fire horse and a unicorn horse. But Diglett is a mole, and Wiglet is an eel. And here, Tentacool is a jellyfish, and Toad School is a mushroom. And other than intelligence, there's not much similarity between mushrooms and jellyfish, so they had to be different Pokémon, making them a part of this new experimental gimmick that relates to convergent evolution. In short, convergent evolution is when two completely unrelated species evolve to look more and more similar as time goes on. Certain body plans and abilities are just better than others, and the better ones survive and spread their genes more, so through the generations they start developing the same biology. Like, look at the thylacine. It looks like a dog, right? Well, too bad, it's not a dog at all. It's a marsupial. Or look at ichthyosaurs and dolphins. One is an ancient reptile, and the other is a modern mammal. They aren't related whatsoever, but they still look so similar. But convergent evolution doesn't have to be so broadly related to the entire body. Individual parts or abilities can convergently evolve as well. For instance, both bats and whales have evolved to use echolocation, despite not being related. And heck, flight and even eyesight evolved uniquely several different times. That's all convergent evolution. So here, there's some ancient jellyfish tentacruel ancestor that looks pretty different, and there's also some different looking ancient ancient mushroom Pokémon that's Toad's Cruel's ancestor. But as the eons went on, they wound up looking more and more similar to one another, eventually into modern day Tentacruel and Toad's Cruel, because this body plan of theirs happens to work really well. They are filling similar niches in their respective ecosystems. It's pretty cool. Pretty bald of Game Freak to look at this ugly thing and decide that it has a premium, superb, beautiful body plan. You might not like it. This is what peak shroom jellyfish looks like. Then again, the only way I could see Toad School's performance improving anymore is if it got little shoes for its little toes. How stylin'! Maybe I should recommend today's sponsor to it. Have you heard of the sneaker brand of Essie? I love them. I got my first pair in 2020 and they are still my go-to shoe whenever I head into town. Also, the longest lasting shoes I've ever had too. Mainly, I just love how comfortable they are. I've got some really odd shaped feet so I am extremely picky with shoes. And they are so flexible, form-fitting, lightweight, stylish, and best of all, waterproof! Perfect for that unpredictable spring weather, or for toad school running through a moist forest. Puddles be damned! As in, these shoes will dam the water from reaching your feet. Like a dam. That's the dam that I said. And the variety of styles work great for any occasion. And their new Stormburst shoes are their most adventure-ready design yet with the grip and coverage of a boot with the comfort of a sneaker. They are a great investment to protect your toes all year long. Plus, here's a deal for you. You can go to the link at the top of the description, bessie.com slash Loxton, and use the code Loxton to get 15% off of each pair of adult Vessi shoes, plus free shipping to all of these regions. Nice. Toad School told us of them! Huh. Oh well. Uh, well, what are they based on? Toad School and Toad's Cruel are known as the Wood Ear Pokemon in the Pokedex, and a Wood Ear, or Tree Ear, is a way to refer to a few edible species of mushroom, and they are very common in Asian cuisine. Notably, Arvin's whole team is based on food, so it's no wonder that he has a Toad's Cruel. And to make this Wood Ear Pokemon so closely resemble Tentacruel and Tentacruel is actually pretty genius, because the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean words for Wood Ears roughly translates to Wood Jellyfish, or Tree Jellyfish. It it absolutely makes perfect sense, and I love that. And I also love the name, Toad School. It's a tentacool, but it doesn't have tentacles anymore. It has toes. It is toad. And the whole name also sounds like toadstool, an old slang term for mushrooms. It's honestly one of the best new names this gen. But now, what mushrooms are they mostly like? Well, Toad School specifically looks a lot like the Auricularia hymir, or Blackwood Ear, which actually used to be considered the Asian 
auricularia, auricula judegi. But recent cladistic studies show that they're a distinct species. And this little footnote is worth bringing up because A. auriculia judei looks a lot like toad school in base color and is also found in Europe, which is where the Iberian Peninsula is, Paldea. Other than the base color though, both mon have these semi-transparent parts. One's yellow and one's a pinkish red. It's just like the same parts on the tentacle line, but this time it's for shroomy reasons rather than fishy ones. So I'd say it resembles the gatation of the bleeding tooth fungus and the bolette. Gatation is essentially a sap that forms droplets along the edges of some plants and fungi. And despite the way they make these two mushrooms look, they are edible. They are non-poisonous. The bolettes are apparently pretty tasty, but the bleeding tooth, uh, Nobody chooses to eat them because apparently they taste extremely foul. But back to wood ears. Another one that Toad School looks like, though really only it's shiny, is Tremilla fusiformis, otherwise known as snow fungus or the white jelly mushroom due to its white color and chewy, jelly-like consistency. It's a very popular ingredient in a wide variety of Asian cuisines, and its name in Japanese translates to white tree jellyfish. And Toad School's flaps that fall from its body are described in Scarlet as chewy and very very delicious. And fun fact, white jelly mushrooms are actually a parasitic yeast until it enters its preferred host, which are a handful of other fungi. White jelly mushrooms aren't native to Spain or any of Europe, really, uh, but it is native to South America, which Paldea draws a lot of inspiration from due to, you know, Spain. But also now these mushrooms are very common in Asia, hence all the cuisine. Actually, this brings up a pretty good point. I keep thinking that these Pokemon are part poison type, both because they're like tentacool and because they are mushrooms. Wild mushrooms are so like, inherently poisonous, right? But no, they're all based on edible mushrooms. There's no poison type to be found. Instead, it's ground grass. Grass, because mushrooms, while not technically plants, are often considered to be plants. Hence all of the other mushroom Pokemon being grass type. And then ground, because... Because it, it walks on the ground instead of swims now? My leg! We'll, uh, we'll get back to that. But Toad School canonically can run up to 30 miles per hour on those skinny little legs, which isn't very fast compared to, say, your average deer, which can run 35 to 45 miles per hour, or the cheetah, which can run up to 75 miles an hour in short bursts. But these kinds of speeds in real life are found on things that have four entire muscled up legs. What if we look at something else with two skinny little legs? Well, if we look at humans, the average human can only run at about five to six miles per hour, or 10 to 15 if you're athletic. And then the fastest human in the world only runs at 28. So these spindly, spongy little leggies sure do make Toad School pretty darn fast comparatively. Perhaps the mushroomy sponginess acts like a spring system. The legs squish down like a running shoe, and when it de-squishes, it propels the body forward faster with more efficiency. So it might be difficult, I know it is for me, but imagine you're going for a morning run, right? You're giving it your all, and then you just see this tiny little zoop guy just zoop right past you like zoop running around you in literal circles like zoop 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 look at it go little dude zoop i mean like why where is it even running to Maybe the toad's cruel colony? When it evolves into toad's cruel, it gets way more legs, but it doesn't seem to do much running anymore. Now they gather into groups and form colonies deep within forests. You can see one of these colonies in its Pokedex photo, and look, they're even having some like deep philosophical conversations. It's like Athens. Then the other Dex entry. They coil their ten tentacles around prey and suck out the nutrients, causing the prey pain. Again, just like Athens. Don't ask. It's time for the wonderful and sometimes horrifying world of fungi! First, let's talk about the Wonderthal. So there's this thing in nature called the mycelial network. Fungi are basically everywhere in nature, even the nature you plop into your planters inside your house. But don't worry, because as I said, this is the wonderful part. You want these fungi in your planters. You see, most fungi in nature are helpful. They attach themselves to plant roots in a symbiotic relationship. They get to siphon off some of the nutrients in the roots and from the plant, and in return, they send both information and nutrients to the plant from other plants and help the roots draw nutrients directly from the soil because the fungi on the roots are connected to other fungi running through the dirt, which in turn are all connected to other plants. 
This is why it's called the Mycelial Network. It is both like the internet and the shipping highway of plants. Some even like to think of it as Mother Nature's neurons. The brain, the mind, the soul of the forest. After all, it's how acorn trees all drop their acorns on the same day as the other acorn trees in the same forest, which ensures that there is such an overabundance of acorns on the forest floor that there is no possible way for all of the squirrels to eat all of them. So, like internet servers or neurons in the brain, each point of the mycelia are constantly sending information back and forth to all the trees, so the signal to release the acorns is sent to the whole forest at once. And this is just one of countless examples of things that they do. Another favorite example of mine is that if something happens to a tree in a forest, say it gets zapped by lightning or just something causes it to lose a lot of its branches, well now that tree is going to struggle to get its nutrients from the sun for quite a while until it can regrow those branches, so the mycelial network will actually reroute nutrients gathered from other nearby trees and deliver those nutrients to the struggling tree. It's, it's the same way the brain sends extra nutrients and hormones to a wound on your body to help it heal faster. It's so cool! And it's all underground happening all around us and perhaps that's another reason why these Pokemon are part ground type now. And you can actually see the mycelial network for yourself. If you gently pull up a plant and peer closely at its roots, you'll most likely see that the roots are covered in the tiniest little white fuzzies. Those little fuzzies are actually fungi. Just some fuzzy little dudes! When you see a mushroom popping up out of the ground, that's called the fruiting body. And it means the mushroom is getting ready, or has already, spread its spores, making even more mycelia. What we typically think of as mushrooms Rooms is actually the final life stage of a tiny microscopic organism that lives inside of huge colonies. And when I say huge, I mean huge, spanning entire forests and regions. And most fungi do not discriminate against other fungi. Multiple species of fungi will all be interwoven together in the mycelial network, which is why it's also sometimes called a mycelial mat or mycelial blanket. And it's this interconnectivity, as well as the horrifying stuff we'll talk about soon, that are a big part of why this line's singular signature ability is so perfect. It's called Mycelium Might, and its flavor text describes it as, the Pokemon will always act more slowly when using status moves, but these moves will be unimpeded by the ability of the target. This is like how Mycelia itself is rather slow, but it really can get all up into the roots or into the bark of the plants that they've attached themselves to. There is no ability that will prevent it from doing so. Which brings me to the horrifying part of the wonderful and sometimes horrible world of fungi. As I mentioned earlier, some fungi parasitize other fungi or plants, or sometimes even insects like the Orpheocordyceps, otherwise known as the zombie ant fungus, or the main inspiration for Paris and Parasect. We talk about them a couple of times in the past. This fungus infects the ant, takes over its brain, and makes it leave the treetops where it lives and go to where it is warmer and more humid, which is perfect for fungal growth. The ant then uses their mandibles to attach themselves to a major vein on the underside of a leaf, where the host remains after its eventual death. Also interesting to note is when the fruiting bodies have ruptured their way through the ant's head, they then in turn become susceptible to being parasitized by other fungi that have evolved to parasitize other parasitic fungi. It's all parasites on parasites on parasites on parasites. The fungi's relationship to their neighbors really is perfect for what mycelium mite does. Decay exists as an extent form of life. It is slow but there is nothing you can do to stop it. Not to mention long before there were big trees, the land was covered in far-reaching, fantastical fungus forests. That spooked me. <laughs> These mushroomy knot trees boasted trunks up to 24 feet high and as wide as three feet, and also are a big part of why we even have trees today at all, because the mycelial roots of these ancient giant mushrooms helped break apart the hard, packed earth and even rocks that comprised the entire ground back then. But it was very, 
very slow going, lasting generations upon generations, which is why it took so long for actual tree forests to start showing up on the geological record. So in a sort of roundabout way, that could be another reason why mycelium might makes all status moves move last in their priority bracket, as well as why these Pokemon have these long roots and are part ground type. Also notable in a lot of mushrooms, as the fruiting body ages, it gets darker. A notable example of this phenomenon is a, that one that I mentioned before and don't want to try to pronounce again. It's the one that Toad School is most reminiscent of, and Toad's Cruel is noticeably darker than Toad School. So it's perfectly reflecting of this. Now, as always, it's question time. It's never not question time here. So new question, why introduce this Pokemon in Paldea specifically? Is Spain or Portugal known for their mushroom dishes? Well, kinda. I mean, with over 1,500 currently identified species of native mushrooms, I'd certainly hope so. A big part of Spanish cuisine is what is known as the tapa, or tapas, plurally. Tapas are like the Spanish version of hors d'oeuvres, or appetite. That is, a series of small, usually pretty looking dishes served either before the main meal or in between courses if it's a meal with multiple courses. It's time for a tangent! You see, tapa means on top of, and before the 19th century, most people were illiterate. Very few innkeepers could write, and even fewer travelers could read. So inns offered the guests a sample of the dishes available on a tapa, the word for a pot cover or pot lid in Spanish. So basically, the innkeeper would come over to a traveler's table with a pot lid covered in small bits of meats and cheeses and other nummy little foods that they offer, and then they would choose from that. It's like a menu you can eat. Why don't we still do this? A very common tapa in Andalusia was a thin slice of bread or meat, and the traveler would use it to cover their glass of sherry in between sips. That way fruit flies wouldn't get all their little buggy bodies all up in it. And since the breads and meats they served were very salty, it would also make the travelers even hungrier and thirstier. So they'd often serve small appetizers with the sherry while you waited for your actual meal. It's all just a scheme to get more money out of ya. But tapas became such a big deal in Spain that they had, and still, have tapas competitions all over the country. And every year, Valladolid, did I say that right? I don't, I don't I'm not gonna look it up. I'm gonna go with that. Valladolid uh, hosts the International Tapas Competition for Culinary Schools. And it's run by the International School of Culinary Arts. So culinary schools from all over the world come to compete for the best tapa concept. So in short, Spain has an official annual competition to invent new appetizers? And mushrooms are super common in those appetizers? Gastronomy is neat. But back to the shrooms themselves, there is a long and ever-expanding list of tapas featuring mushrooms from, oh, that's a word, champagnes a la gino, bolitos croquettes, scrambled eggs, oh, that, that one I can say, scrambled eggs with wild mushrooms, much easier to say. But yeah, it's no wonder mushrooms are so popular and the mushrooms are extremely absorbent. They just absorb the flavors around them. And they're so heavy in nutrients. It's no wonder they're so heavily featured in tapas. However, mushrooms aren't really everywhere in Spain, though, because actually only a small area of Spain is the right amount of warmth, shade, and humidity for mushrooms to grow on a large scale. The two main areas in Spain where wild mushrooms are produced is Castilla-La Mancha and also La Rioja. R Rioja. Yeah, don't say the J, J is a Y. Still learning. And actually here, mushrooms are their second most produced product right after wine. Another tangential fun fact. Squid is also extremely common in tapas, significantly more so than it being um, in a main course, actually. And so, this Pokemon's similarity to the squiddy, jellyfishy like line tentacool makes all the more sense. And speaking of them, let's go ahead and talk about them too. After all, they are the basis of these new Pokemon design-wise. Tentacool and Tentacruel are OG Pokemon, and are most obviously jellyfish of some sort. In fact, in the red and blue beta, Tentacool's name was originally Jelly, and Tentacruel's was Manowar, which gives us another hint about Tentacruel's inspirations, but we'll cover that in a bit. First, let's talk about Tentacool. Jellyfish are a part of what's called Cnidaria, a philium of aquatic animals that have nidocytes, which are specialized 
cells that they use almost exclusively to catch prey, which in the case of the jellyfish involves stinging their prey to immobilize them, which is exactly what Tentacool and Tentacruel both do, and it relates to their poison typing. The Daria also have a non-living jelly-like layer called the Mesolgul. Actually, I prefer that pronunciation to the real one. Mesolgul. It sounds like a jelly thing. Well, in jellyfish, it's the squishy stuff that is the bell of its main body. It is composed mostly of water, with just a few other things thrown in to give it structure. And thus, we get this Pokedex entry. Tentacool's body is largely composed of water. If it is removed from the sea, it dries up like parchment. If this Pokemon happens to become dehydrated, put it back into the sea! Uh oh. Uh, that makes me a bit worried about whether it's ethical to even use a tentacool in a land-based battle. Especially if the battle is prolonged or Arceus forbid in a desert. And this jelly in and of itself isn't actually alive in any capacity, interestingly enough. Or at least not any more alive than, say, <laughs> your spit is. Is that alive? It's making you feel emotions, I'm sure. Does that make it alive? Really, this jelly is a hydrostatic skeleton, meaning it's a squishy and watery protective layer, essentially. It's like armor that it makes, but it's squishy. But given that the jellyfish's main way of hunting is by stinging hard enough to stun or even kill their prey, they definitely use this squishy armor more as a way to just not get hurt when being bumped by things. Many species of jellyfish are bioluminescent, meaning that they glow, which may very well be the inspiration for both Mon and the line being able to shoot lasers out of their bulbous head protrusions. But actually, these bulbous head protrusions, their eye placements and their tentacles and their laser shooting abilities, and heck, even the first main episode in the anime with them, where they invade a city almost militaristically and even take over the mind of Meowth to communicate with people, that all points to another big inspirational source. Classic alien invasion B-movies, especially those that use the bug-eyed monster trope with all the tentacles, you know? I mean, jellyfish are pretty UFO-shaped, just like Tentacruel's head. And actually, your classical Japanese depiction of UFOs always have these three or sometimes five little glowing orbs on the bottom, perhaps like Tentacruel's three glowing orbs on top, eh? Really, it's no wonder that we base so many alien monsters on tentacled sea life. I mean, jellyfish look pretty alien, don't they? Why is that? Well, because fun fact, jellyfish are the oldest group of animals to have multiple organs. The group has existed for at least 500 million years, though there is some compelling evidence to suggest that they go as far back as 700 million years. So of course they'd look alien, they evolved when the world was a totally different place. Tentacool is very reminiscent of many species in the box jellyfish group. They're called box jellyfish because their head bells look more box-like than bell-like. Though I'd say they look much more bag-like. I mean, just turn it upside down, tie those legs together, and bam! You got yourself a nice little reusable grocery bag for your groceries! Many box jellyfish species are also some of the most venomous animals in the world, hence the poison typing. And also, fun fact, they have 24 eyes. <laughs> Egad. Though, only two of them are what you and I would think of when we say eyes. The rest are a lot more simple, and basically only do simple things like detect light or dark, and help with very, very basic navigation, like which way is up. But this overabundance of eyes could also very well be what inspired these red eye-like blorbs on top of their heads. Uh, after all, look at this Pokedex entry. Yeah, it says right there, the orbs resemble eyes. But also, box jellyfish are also the only jellyfish to have those two true complex eyes. Thus, these two Pokemon also having two more traditional eyes. In a Gen 1 Pokemon sense, anyway. Now, it's time to take a gander at this class of comb jelly, the Tentaculata. Oh, hey. That name's cool. The Martensia ovum is the most well-known in the class, and it has the glowing bits like Tentacool's glowing bits. And it also only has two tentacles in the same way that Tentacool only has two tentacles. And again, the class name, Tentaculata. It sounds like Tentacool if you didn't put that together already. But also note, the thing that makes comb jellies special is their ability to contract their tentacles, which most other jellyfish can't do. And according to the Pokedex, Tentacruel is able to do so. Its 80 tentacles can stretch and contract freely. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't count 80 tentacles there. Eight, nine, ten, ten. No, no, there's definitely not. 
So either it has a lot more tentacles contracted into its body at the moment, as it's a grower, not a shower, or perhaps each tentacle we see is actually a cluster of tentacles? Or maybe the Pokedex is wrong in this one entry. Oh, in all of these entries. But hey, now we can go full circle by talking about the Portuguese Man of War. Paldea is based on Spain and Portugal, and obviously Tentacruel being the Portuguese Man of War had to be here, but instead they went the extra mile and gave us a Tentacruel-like, Man of War-like, mushroom Pokemon. Uh, but anyway, yeah, its beta name was Man of War, and it acts like a Man of War. Portuguese Man of War are otherwise known as blue bottles because they look like weird lumpy glass bottles that are blue floating along the top of the ocean, which is probably why this Pokemon line is blue, and why the shinies are a purpley color, because sometimes blue bottles would actually be more of a purpley blue mauve blue. Oh hey, that looks pretty familiar. Do you think this creature is the inspiration for Halo's Needler? Or the Hanar in Mass Effect? more aliens. Well, these Pokemon are described as weak swimmers, which is fitting of the Man of War, who just floats along the surface of the water thanks to its pneumatophore, which is like an air bladder filled with poisonous carbon monoxide. And it just floats along, using the sail on its back as a sail to catch the wind, hoping that its tentacles will catch prey at some point. It's just like how these Pokemon are often portrayed with their heads just above their water tentacles dangling below, just kind of chilling going. You see, despite what most people think, most jellyfish are actually pretty agile and efficient swimmers, especially considering they have no brains. So this aspect of the Pokemon is actually much more fitting of the Man of War than of your typical jellyfish. Oh yeah, because Man of War aren't actually jellyfish. Man of War are siphonophores, and siphonophores are actually a colonial species. This is not one creature, this is several individuals. The individuals are called zooids, and they are genetically identical to the other individuals living within the same colony, though they all are differently bodied because they all serve specialized purposes, which just sounds sort of like how our cells work. Maybe? But in this case, um, it's more like a colony of insects that all get velcroed together. They all came from the same prozooid who reproduced the rest asexually, but they still live their lives as either a polyp or a medusa, which are essentially the various almost larval, pupae, and adult stages of the species. There's like a whole metamorphosis thing we didn't get into, uh, and I don't wanna. But just know, here they are all free-thinking individuals, living attached to each other. So I guess it's more like if your organs were born from your brain, but each of them also had their own little bodies, each with their own little brains, and they just taped themselves together. Uh, I guess, I, 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 I don't know. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Colonality hurts my brain, man. It's like an inexperienced crew on a ship, all on board with one goal in mind, survive. But they are fully at the behest of the ocean, floating around in a little helpless boat, which is also why that these Man of War are named after the ship type. The Man of War. Specifically, the Caraval, which they most closely resemble, and is also Portuguese, which is why these are called the Portuguese Man of War. Final point time though, as we mentioned before, the line also has taken some inspiration from squids. Squids are cephalopods like octopi, cuttlefish, and nautiluses and the like, and they have two tentacles and eight arms. Yes, only the two long ones in front with the wide bit at the end are tentacles, the other ones are arms. Octopuses, or octopi, or octopeople, or octolings, or octos, um, they, they don't have technicals technically, they have arms. Because you see, they don't end in an appendage that's thicker than the stock, like a club. But yeah, that does technically mean that Tentacool definitely has two tentacles, as defined just now. Not only that, but the clubs at the end of these tentacles have those little lines on them, which seems to imply that they are especially dexterous and nimble just like the tentacles of squids, which are retractable, just like tentacruels. Also, the two really strange hard bits on the bottom of tentacruel that I've never understood until now seem to be inspired by the gladius or pen of a squid, which is the only skeletal part on a squid and is internal and made of chitin, but it is strangely external on Tentacruel, probably just to show how fierce and scary it is, but also it could be to resemble a beak, 
like what squids and octopi have on this middle of their bottoms. Um, though it doesn't really snap open and closed like the beaks do. So it's like a combination of those two things. Either way though, ultimately, it's a way cool Pokemon that pulls from many sources, and that's what makes it so dang cool in my eyes, and that's also why this video is so dang long, despite talking about one of the most stinking common and irritating little guys in the franchise. At least you're not Wingle or Geodude, but you're close to that. And now with the introduction of Toad's cool, it's it's really, it's, it's just all the more cool. It's double cool. What Pokemon do you think are double cool? Let me know down below. And hey, if you want to hear me be wrong about Wiglet for five minutes, check out this video here. It's still fun, trust me, and never stop using your noggin. I need a lozenge.